Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time it's a kind of stepping stone video as we're going to learn how to control these things, servo motors, using a Raspberry Pi. This will prove critical in certain upcoming projects, so let's go and get started. So, here we have a servo, or more specifically, this is an SG90 servo, which is the most common type of small servo in the world, and which is often used in things like model boats and aircraft. And uh, SG90s like this are made by many different manufacturers, and I bought this one in a pack of five from Amazon Co. UK for £8.99, with a similar pack costing $9.99 from Amazon.com. And with each individual servo, you get a set of three actuator arms or horns with screws to fasten them to the rotating shaft. Although here, I've simply pushed the actuator arm on top. It just goes on like that and stays on pretty well just by a push fit. That'll be fine for the test purposes in this video. Oh, and I should note, it's not a good idea to try and rotate the shaft manually. You could damage the mechanism inside the servo. To explain what a servo is and how it's controlled, it's best to compare a servo to a motor. And so here we have a very small motor with a gearbox on the front. And like all motors, this has got an axle here which will spin continuously in one direction or the other, depending on how the power is applied. And to control a motor like this with a Raspberry Pi, we'd need to use a motor controller, such as this L298M, which I've used in previous robotics projects. And when this is all wired up, power for the motor is supplied to the controller and signals from two GPIO pins on the Pi are used to turn the motor either one way or the other. Now, in contrast to a motor, a servo does not spin continuously. Rather, it allows precise control of the angular position of its shaft and actuator arm. And to achieve this, inside a servo, there's a motor, some gearing, a potentiometer or other feedback sensor to read the angle of the shaft, and finally, some control electronics. It really is amazing that we get all of this in a tiny case for less than a few pounds or dollars. Now, as you can see, while a motor has two wires, a servo has three wires coming out of it, and two of these are positive and negative power leads, which for this SG90 need to supply between 4.8 and 6 volts, with the positive lead being red and the ground rail being brown. The third orange wire is then used to supply a control signal, which needs to be a pulse width modulation or PMW square wave. Like most analog servos, the SG90 accepts a 50 Hz square wave, so a pulse is expected every 0.2 seconds. The angle of the servo is controlled by the length of the positive pulse. The longer the length of the pulse or duty cycle, the larger the angle the servo turns to and attempts to hold itself at. The range of potential values for the duty cycle varies a little between servos, but for my SG90s is from 2 and 12% of the period of the wave, with a 2% duty cycle corresponding to a servo angle of 0 degrees and a 12% duty cycle corresponding to a servo angle of 180 degrees. We'll return to these figures again when we look at our servo control code. As you can see, the wires from an SG90 are terminated in a single three-pin female connector, and the easiest way to connect this to the pin on a Raspberry Pi is to use a number of these male to female jumper leads, which are connecting to the end of this connector like this. There we are, that can now plug into different GPIO pins on a Raspberry Pi. And if you're wondering where do you get jumper leads like this, well, you buy them in the ribbons like these, uh, where you can just peel off the ones you want. And as with everything else, I'll provide appropriate links in the video description. Right, I've now connected our SG90 to a Raspberry Pi and specifically, this is a Raspberry Pi 3B+, Plus, which I think remains the most popular model in common use, although you can use any model of Pi. Do note, though, that a Raspberry Pi is not the world's most accurate servo controller, as most of its GPIO pins output software-generated PWM signals, which are less accurate than those created by dedicated hardware. 
the Python code modules that we're using in this video also only work with software generated PWM signals. But for all but the most critical applications, everything will work just fine. As we can see in this diagram, the servo signal wire is connected to GPIO pin 11, while its negative power wire goes to pin 6 and the positive to pin 4, which supplies 5 volts. Usually, servos are powered with an independent power supply, such as a battery pack, with only the control signal and ground rails connected to the Pi. This is because servos can draw a lot of power, which could potentially crash or reset the Pi. However, as we're only using one tiny SG90 servo, taking power from the Pi's 5 volt rail should be OK, and I am using a 3 amp power supply here. So, let's move from the, the Pi itself to uh, the desktop. This is a Raspbian, the latest version of Raspbian, Raspbian Buster. And in Raspbian Buster, if we look in the menu under Programming, we don't have Idle anymore, which I'd like to use in the past. We uh, have to use Sony a Python audience. We could install Idle, but I'll use Sony here because it's pre-installed. So here I've run up Sony, there it is. And as you can see, I've got some test pieces of code to control the server. So what does this do? Well, basically, initially, we're importing some libraries GPIO library and the time library because we're going to need those. And we're setting a numbering for a GPIO on the Pi to the board numbering mode, which means the pins are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 across the board in what I think is the most logical fashion. I always use board numbering. Next, we're setting up pin 11 as an output and setting servo 1 as pin level with a PWM control. So GPIO setup 11, GPIO out, that sets pin 11 as an output. And then we're defining servo 1 as a GPIO PWM at 1150. 11 there is the pin, 50 is the pulse frequency, which is 50 hertz for our analog servo, so that's why we've got 1150. After that, we're going to start PWM running on that pin, but with the pulse turned off. So we're doing servo 1 start, but 0 for have the pulse off. So that means nothing's been sent to the servo to attempt to do anything, it won't be drawing power, trying to move things around, it'll simply be waiting to see what's going to happen next. And then after that, we're going to wait for two seconds. We're doing a lot of this in this code, just so we can keep track of what's going on. After that, we're going to move the servo. So let's move down a little bit. And there's various bits of code here to move it around a bit to give you a principle. But initially, we're going to rotate it to 180 degrees in 10 steps. 18 degree steps. Why 18 degree steps? I guess it's what I happen to do. It's what this code does. So to do this, we're going to define a variable called duty, which is going to be the duty cycle of the PWM signal going into the servo, initially at a value of 2. And down here we've got a while loop, as you can see, and this is basically going to cycle from the values of 2 to 12, which represent the position of the servo from 0 to 180 degrees, and it's going to cycle through those, waiting a second between each. So basically, while duty is less than or equal to 12, which initially it is, it's a value of 2, it'll say servo 1, change duty cycle to duty, initially 2, it's then going to wait for a second, duty equals duty plus 1, it'll go back to there, it'll be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and we'll have rotated this servo through all of those positions, waiting a second between each. After that, we're waiting a couple of seconds more. Why not? No, it's good to wait a few seconds. And then after that, a couple of bigger moves, we're going to turn the servo back to 90 degrees by setting servo change duty cycle to 7, which is halfway between 2 and 12, if you think about it. Again, we'll wait a couple of seconds. And then we'll turn back to zero, which is a value of two. And then finally on the end, always a good idea, very important, clean things up. We'll set the servo to stop. We'll stop the servo, clean up our GPIO pins, and we'll print goodbye. So that's what we're going to do. So let's now bring up the servo onto the screen like that. And then we'll run this code. It's very exciting, isn't it? Let's execute the code. Oh, we're waiting two seconds, and now... Yes, it's little steps for starting. It's a bit jittery, isn't it? Let me uh, stop him moving around. And you might see it jitters a bit between the actual stages. It steps there and comes around now. And again, it's a little bit unsafe, a little bit un un unsteady. Um, what's going on there? Let's just run that code again to show you what's happening. Let's run the code a second time. It'll wait a second and then start doing its steps. But it's sort of hesitating, it's jittering a bit on each step when it gets there. Because what the servo is doing is being sent a signal to hold it at a particular position. And therefore its sensor is trying to sense its position there, and then it sometimes isn't quite there, so the server moves back and forth, it jitters a little bit. How can we get rid of that jitter, you cry? 
Well, we could do it using another piece of code, which I happen to have over here. What a surprise. This opens up exactly the same way, libraries and board numbering, setting up the pin, uh, etc., and then waiting for a bit after we've uh, set things up. But now I've altered our little loop because here we're going to say while duty is less than or equal to 12, and we'll set the duty cycle to be duty, but then we're going to set it to the value, the angle we've asked it to go to, wait for a 0.3 seconds, which just gives it time to get there. We're then going to put duty cycle to zero, which is basically no pulse. So basically we move the servo and then we stop moving it. And then we wait for the rest of the time we were looking to wait for 0.7 seconds here. It could be any number you wanted to. And then we'll go through the cycle again. And similarly down here, does exactly the same thing. Uh, we've got a I'm waiting 0.5, let's let the server move around. You have to experiment a bit, and it'll wait for one and a half seconds. And down here, again, the same sort of thing, and still clean up on the end. So let's bring the servo back in and run the code again. And hopefully you'll see when it runs, what it waits for two seconds first, and then after each move, it's steadier, because it's moving, stopping, moving, stopping, moving, stopping, moving, stopping, moving, stopping, moving, stopping. Wait a second, big move coming up. Oh, there we are. Nice and steady, nice and steady. Now, the one thing to point out that there is a flaw in this method, which is that when you're sending a pulse to the servo, say, to stay at a particular angle, it's using its motor to stay there. So if it was at tension, the motor would be trying to keep it at position. Whereas if we turn it off, then there's nothing to stop it moving. This said, if you just go to the servo, look, this isn't nowhere. This is quite sturdy. So unless you had a lot of torque on this, it's perfectly reasonable to move it and turn it off. This is sort of jitter you'll get in cheaper servos and analog servos. Remember, this is a very cheap servo. We have to accept its limitations. Another bit of code I've got here, which is servo test code three. I'll make all of these available to you. Our links in the video description if you want to play with this code. This just shows you going to particular angles. So again, we set things up the same way, imported libraries, number, setting up pin, starting, etc. But now what we've got is a bit of code to allow the user to input a value and the server will go to that value. So this is an infinite loop here. And so I put the infinite loop because it says while true, while true is true forever. So this is an infinite loop. I put that inside a try finally setup. And the reason for that is we've got an infinite loop, so we'll have to break out of it by pressing Control C. And if you use try and finally, finally it's always executed, even if you break out of a loop. So that just means on the end of this code, we'll always stop the servo, clean up the GFIO pins, and of course, print goodbye. It's very important to print goodbye on the end of this program. Anyway, back to the important bit, which is the loop here. So while true, what it's going to basically do is define angle by asking for an input. So angle equals float input. Float means it's going to be a floating pointer variable. It's going to be a number rather than the piece of text we're inputting. And it says enter an angle between 0 and 180. Server 1 change duty cycle to angle over 18 plus 2. If you think about it, that's the code you need because 2 is 0 and 12 is the total rotation. So we basically divide by 18 to get the number and add 2 to it to get the right angle. If that's made any sense at all, it'll work, honestly. Then we're going to wait for a 0.5 seconds, then we're going to turn the server off again to leave it at that position, and it'll, of course, it'll go back and keep asking for a figure. So if we execute this piece of code, we'll go up here and uh, execute the code. It's come up. Enter an angle between 0 and 180. I've got to think of an angle now. Let's pick 30. It's gone to 30. Let's pick uh, 45. Let's pick 90. Let's pick 135. I'm being very uh, regular, aren't I? Let's pick 67.64. Oh, that's exactly right, isn't it? That's good. Uh, 180. There we are. Uh, back to 30. Back to zero. It's proving a principle, isn't it? And if we press a control C, it'll come out in a fairly controlled way. So that's, that's nice and good. So there we are. That's shown us some basic code to actually control a single servo using a Raspberry Pi. Right, here I am back again, and as you can see, I've now got two SG90s, two servos connected to a Raspberry Pi. I'm going to call them Servo 1 and Servo 2. And the wiring here has got the second servo connected to a GPO pin 12 for its uh, signal pin, and it's using pin 9 as its ground rail, its negative rail, and pin 2 for 5 volt, which is a second uh, 5 volt pin on the Raspberry Pi. 
And I should say, as I said earlier, normally when you power servos, you use a separate independent power supply. It should be a lot more like this here, but I'm only running two small servos and I'm using a three amp power supply on the Raspberry Pi, so this will work. This is okay for now. So let's go back to our code. Here we are back in the Thony in the Raspbian. This code is pretty much as we had before, imports libraries, sets the numbering, except here we now set up two pins to be servos. As you can see, we're defining servo one as we did previously, but also servo two. Then after that, we just scroll down a little bit. We're gonna start them both running with a PWM, and then we're going to do a few moves just to show we can control two servos at once. First of all, turn the first servo to 90, which is going on there. Then we're going to wait for a couple of seconds. We like waiting for a few seconds in this code, don't we? It just shows us what's going on. And if we go down a bit further, where are we down here? We're then going to move servo two to 90 and servo one back to zero, which is that code there. Uh, we're then going to wait for two seconds again, and then we're going to do some more rotating, what servo two to 180 and servo one to 90, and then finally we'll move them back uh, to the uh, the starting positions. So that's what's going to go on. This is just demonstrating to you we can control two servos. So let's bring the servos into view and execute this code. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that was one of the most exciting things ever. We proved we can control multiple servos using a Raspberry Pi. As we'll see in future videos, the ability to control servo motors presents all kinds of possibilities for building robots, as well as Raspberry Pi vehicles and home automation. But now that's it for another video. If you enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.